The Gnostic heresy is not a single heresy. It is a family of heresies. The Manichaean heresy that Allison talks about in the book is simply one of many versions of the Gnostic heresy. The Gnostic heresy is not simply an ancient heresy. It is also practiced in this day and age, including organized religions, one of which is quite prominent here in the state of Arizona. So what is the Gnostic heresy in all of its forms? The Gnostic heresy comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Now, the problem is not with knowledge in and of itself. Knowledge is a good thing. The problem with knowledge in the Gnostic heresy, within the context of the Gnostic heresy, is what they do with knowledge. So for Gnostics, salvation can be had through a secret knowledge, by possessing a secret knowledge. So if you were to join a Gnostic church, you would join as a novice and sit at the feet of these masters who alone carry this secret. And through memorization, through incantation, through acquiring this secret knowledge, you were saved. Saved from what? Most Gnostic groups would tell you that your spirit is imprisoned by matter, that your body is a cage, that creation is evil, or they would say that at the very least, the spiritual realm is superior to the material realm, and the material realm is best escaped from. So you acquire the secret knowledge, and the secret knowledge makes you more detached from the, from the material world. Your soul becomes more detached from your body. So upon death, your soul is free. Free to do what? Join their conception of who God is. And for many, for many Gnostics, God is utterly unknowable. So your spirit, free from the material realm, goes to join the unknowable God in the superior spiritual realm. Now, why is this heresy cruel? Well, ask yourself this. What about people who suffer from Down syndrome or some other cognitive disability? What about people who have cognitive, full cognitive health? but whose intellectual gifts go more toward the concrete rather than, rather than abstract thought? What about people who, through no fault of their own, cannot acquire this knowledge because they're far away from a Gnostic group or are refused admission? Why is that cruel? So pause and give yourself a couple minutes to think about it, and then resume the video. Okay, so you've thought about it, and I hope that you'll conclude that the reason why this heresy is cruel is because salvation is reserved for an elite of some kind, for some special select group, and everybody else is dismissed. Everybody else is condemned, along with creation, as either evil and or unsaved. That's why orthodox teaching is very important, because orthodox teaching says that salvation is in a person, Jesus Christ and your salvation is based on your relationship with that person, Jesus Christ. Now, unlike the television preachers who would like you to think that your salvation is based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, for Catholics, even that is not enough. Yes, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is important, but your relationship is not simply individual, it is also communal. So it's important to not simply have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but also have a relationship in a community, a community of character, a community of holiness, the community that Jesus Christ gave us through the apostles, the church. So this relationship with Jesus Christ that saves is not simply individual, it is also communal. It is not only an individual, and not only does it have an individual dimension, but it has a social dimension. This is not to say that knowledge is unimportant. Knowledge is a means to an end. Knowledge enables us to understand our faith. So the reason why you study the faith, the reason why the church gives us our parishes, our schools, universities like Benedictine, the reason why we have this rich body of knowledge is to enrich, better understand why we believe as we do. But again, that knowledge is a means to an end. It is not salvation in and of itself. And this is a good thing because it democratizes with a small d, salvation. In other words, 
it makes it accessible to everyone who chooses to believe in Jesus within the context of the church and its saving message. So someone with Down syndrome, yeah, they're being denied something by not knowing the fullness of theology, but they can nonetheless have a rich relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ through the spiritual treasures of the church by being part of a church community. John Paul II said that Down syndrome people should not be pitied, but people who should be honored, respected, because their innocent approach to God is something that we could imitate. And when we say innocent, we do not mean ignorant, but this openness, this trust that people like that have. So they can be our teachers. There is no room for intellectual snobbery in the church. So people who, through no fault of their own, cannot know, they can nonetheless be saved through this relationship with Jesus Christ, individually and communally in the church, and they can contribute through their spiritual riches, through their own spiritual development. Um, uh, our understanding of God, which is not just through intellect, it is also through spirit. But having said that, the more you know, the better off your relationship with God is, insofar as you can better understand it. So we should know as much as we can know, using the resources and the intellect that God has given us. And for those who, through no fault of their own, cannot develop their intellects, you can compensate through the heart, through your empathy. And that does not let us, uh, let us off the hook. I mean, someone like me has to develop the heart as well as the mind. Again, no room for intellectual snobbery in the church. So with this relationship with Jesus Christ, God is knowable, mysterious, but knowable. We should not confuse mystery with unknowability. What we mean by mystery is that we never get, we never exhaust God, we never get to the bottom of who God is, that there's always more to know. And when it comes to the Gnostic dismissal of nature, of creation as being evil, well, it comes from a misreading, a terrible misreading of the Bible. In the New Testament, you see two Greek words, soma and sarx. Soma means the body, our embodied selves. It can also, by extension, include creation. And the body is never the source of sin. Creation, which is fundamentally good, intrinsically good, is never the source of sin. God does not make junk. So where does sin come from? Sin comes from sarx, and here we have to be careful, because sarx translates as flesh. Have I just contradicted myself? No. The Greeks, with their limited psychological vocabulary, were trying to get at something else. What they really meant by flesh was not our embodied selves, which again is fundamentally good. What they meant was our lower appetites. Those things that drag down, that corrupt, that degrade the human body, that degrade creation, those baser things, those lesser angels of our nature that make us go to sin. And that is always the source of sin. So what are some examples to, to distinguish Soma from Sarx? Enjoying a wonderful meal. Soma. Gluttony. Pigging out. Sarx. Enjoying a nice pint of beer, of quality beer. Soma. Getting drunk all the time. Or getting drunk even once. Sarx. Enjoying a good night's sleep. Soma, sleeping all hours so that you are lazy and not attending to your day-to-day -day responsibilities. Sarx, working hard. Soma, working until you drop or to the point of exhaustion all the time. That can be Sarx. So, Soma is the right use of our embodied selves, using the goods of creation properly, virtuously, in a holy way. Sarx is when we turn to those things that degrade. And that is something that the Gnostics missed and Orthodox teaching gets. After all, because Jesus Christ, God, became incarnate, that shows us, yet again, 
that creation is a good thing. Otherwise, why would God bother?